this is uh, uh, an amazing picture of the uh, Chrysler tank arsenal built by Albert Kahn Associates in uh, Detroit in 1940-41. Uh, in opening this, to this dance to the event, which is uh, challenged by the beautiful weather outside, uh, I want first of all to give some background on its origins. It has been already said. This symposium has emerged at the initiative, it's really interesting to say that, of, of two students, two doctoral students from the Institute of Fine Arts, Anna Josef Hatzka and Susan Schaefer, who had participated to a seminar had, um, held several, several years ago on architectural practice during the war. This event builds upon the work done at that time and also last year as I continued the research and the conversation at Princeton's uh, School of Architecture. Uh, these seminars were both based on a series of hypotheses that had shaped some 10 years ago, be beginning them to envision a research program that would be concluded by an exhibition. The Canadian Center for Architecture has enthusiastically and enthusiastically respond to this idea and has decided to include the project in its program for 2010, possibly in cooperation with the Dutch Architectural Institute, which would subsequently host the show in 2011. So there is a horizon. Uh, in this framework, this week weekend symposium is an essential articulation in what is a rather long process. Uh, and aims at ex exchanging ideas on the base of research done by scholars belonging to different generations, but with a clear emphasis on the findings of doctoral candidates or uh, people I would call fresh uh, doctors. It should be the first in a series of recurrent events focused on architecture at the Institute of Fine Arts. We are envisioning uh, um, yearly uh, meetings. We'll see what the economic situation will low. Uh, but, as such today, it is the result of the generous institutional and financial support of both the Canadian Centre and Princeton School of Architecture. So let me begin by expressing my gratitude to Mirko Zardini uh, and Alexis Sorna in charge of the CCA Study Centre and to Stan Allen for their resolute support to this initiative. At the IFA, the project has been warmly uh, encouraged by the Interim Director Michel Marincola and made possible by the engagement of Kathy Hines and Christina Snellick at the Office of Public Affairs and by the contribution of Jenny Roda and Jason Verone of Visual Resources, uh, thanks to whom everything will be glitchless today uh, and tomorrow. The role of Anna Josef Hatzka and Susan Schaefer has continued throughout the process to be essential in dealing with issues such as scheduling, discussing with participants and, and potential um, attendance, and organizing materially these two days of debate. And of course, I thank all the speakers, who, some of whom have traveled uh, from as far as Japan, and the moderators who have sometimes come also a long way. I also thank Ken Kenneth Frampton, uh, who, has, who had committed to give a keynote address. He seems to be, um, uh, to some extent, uncertain. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if he shows up eventu eventually. And John Oakman, who will conclude the discussion tomorrow. But let me uh, briefly establish the outline of the questions to be addressed here. The first assumption on which this symposium is based is that, in contrast to the picture given by nearly all histories of architecture of the 20th century, the Second World War has been a founding moment in the diffusion of, of modernism and in the process of modernization. Of course, problems dealing with the reconstruction of bomb cities have been discussed for decades and are subject to an increased scrutiny today in relationship, for instance, with issues of historic preservation, preserving post-war areas in Europe and elsewhere. But the episodes most directly related to the conflict have also a meaning in the field of architecture, urban planning, as well as in landscape design. Involving all the continents in a direct or indirect manner, this highly industrial war, the second industrial war, but one which was really, as Walter Benjamin famously said, the revenge of the forces of production, this war has unquestionably been a rightful fight of the democracies and their allies against criminal regimes. So let me say this, looking at this war, it might sound uh, a little defensive, but it's really important. We're dealing here with a key episode in 
of the fight of democracy against uh, uh, the barbarians. During the eight years spanning from the Legion Condor bombing of Ghanica, maybe you can dim the lights now a little bit, um, from the, the eight years spanning from uh, the bombing of Ghanica to the atomic explosion over Hiroshima, all the generations and all the professions have been to a degree or another concerned by war altogether global and total. Few human manifestations illustrate better the concept of total social fact defined by the anthropologist Marcel Mauss. Architects have not remained immune during and idle during these years, and I could say that architecture as a practice as a whole has been drafted as such. If we look at this cover of Bruno Zevi's magazine Metron, issued in 1949, um, if I remember well, we see going clockwise from top left, Erich Mendelssohn, who, yes, Erich Mendelssohn, who built a mock-up German city to test incendiary bombs in Utah. Alba Alto, who built war production facilities in Finland. Frank Lloyd Wright, who, died, uh, who designed unbuilt factory housing. Uh, Erich Gunnar Asplund, well, he died too soon and belonged to a neutral country, so it doesn't belong to a picture. Uh, <laughs> um, Richard Neutra, uh, who built wartime factory housing in Texas and uh, California. Ms. Van der Rohe, whose early IIT buildings were directly related to the war effort and who, whose projects, like the Museum for a Small City, were related to a sort of post-war projection of American architects. Uh, Walter Gropius, who built wartime factory housing and Le Corbusier, who designed an ammunition factory and celebrated, uh, rather strangely, the virtues of water and huts for the progress of human, human civilization. If we enlarge the circle to a sort of portrait gallery of architects who were not part of the star system of modernism, an unending series of biographical episodes can be delineated. And here I'm just giving some examples. Um, Albert Speer, of course, was the highest ranking of all wartime architects after having become the Reich's Minister for Armament and was an authentic uh, war criminal and tried as such. Uh, Herbert Rimpel uh, uh, created a multinational architectural firm operating in all occupied countries of Europe. Konstantin Gutschow here built bunkers in Hamburg. Uh, Friedrich, Friedrich Tanz built flag towers in several German cities and in Vienna before becoming the happy planner of post-war Dusseldorf. Antonin Raymond uh, also built, like Mendelssohn, a Japanese mock-up uh, mock town in Utah, a Japanese one to test incendiary bombs. The landscape designer Dan Kiley uh, designed the interiors of the Nuremberg trial rooms in 1945. So, the landscape designers also drafted. Uh, Laszlo Mohoynaj here taught camouflage at his Chicago Institute of Design. Bertolt Dubetkin uh, designed with all the Arab air red protection schemes for London already in 1949. Konrad Waxman, here seen is in an early photo, imagined a system of prefabricated houses for war and peace times and also worked for the Utah uh, bombing experiments. The IMSAs developed plywood shapes for airplane production. And also, uh, of course, we have to be aware of the victims among the architects of people whose wartime ex experience was not one like uh, Le Corbusier's or Gropius of other or others, uh, a period of uh, professional development. Uh, Giuseppe Pagano, who died in Mauthausen uh, here, and also of architects who were prisoners and still working as, as designers. Simon Circus at the bottom right survived Auschwitz where he worked in the architectural office. 